Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome uh, today here for this uh, first uh, series for our Louvain Internationalization uh, Forum. So first of all, it's my great pleasure to welcome here Professor Mary Clark from the uh, Royal College of Surgeons uh, in Ireland. And let me give you first a few words of uh, introduction uh, about her background. So um, Mary was educated in Trinity College, Dublin, um, and also in the London School of Hygiene and uh, Tropical Medicine. And she's now a lecturer at the Department of Psychology and also the Department of Psychiatry at the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. Now, that's where she coordinates uh, teaching in neuroscience, both for uh, medicine and also um, uh, physiotherapy students at undergraduate level. Now, she's also a researcher, and as researcher, she's an expert um, in the developmental mental illness um, study uh, in childhood, adolescence, and into adulthood. But today, she's also here in another capacity. She's uh, also a vice dean for international citizenship, and that's in the Faculty of Medicine and Health Science. Now, she's really a key player in internationalization, and I had the great pleasure to meet her in Ireland at a conference where she pre presented an initiative that um, she created uh, in Ireland, which is about that citizenship uh, award. And I found this initiative very inspiring. I thought this is something that uh, I would like to share with uh, you all here because it's something quite innovative and that uh, answers a lot of uh, uh, questions. Now, dear Mari, you have here in front of you uh, many of the key players uh, in the internationalization of our own institution. Um, you have academics, also administrative staff. And this here today is uh, the first event uh, of a new initiative which was uh, meant actually to bring people together that are interested uh, in internationalization and to simply share ideas, see how we can move forward. And the idea is that uh, everybody can pick and choose ideas that are interested, interesting for their own um, work uh, and also, of course, bring to the discussion and uh, inspire others. So I'm really delighted that you accepted to, to come here, not only to uh, share your own experience, but also you know, as uh, the, the keynote for this uh, kickoff event uh, of our new uh, forum. So I'm not going to take any much more of your time, and I'll leave the floor to you. Thank you again. Thank you very much for, for that nice introduction, and it's a it's a pleasure to be here, um, in your in your great uh, university and your, your lovely town, and um, it's wonderful to be here on such a, a lovely sunny day and see all your wonderful students interacting in, in such wonderful ways outside. So first of all, I'm going to talk just a little bit about the context um, in which we operate um, in terms of international higher education. Um, first, I'll talk about our context in, in Ireland and I suppose the history and development of international education in Ireland and then come on to talk about um, the dev our, our development as an institution both in terms of how we have come to have such an international student body and also to have such a significant I suppose, global presence in terms of our international campuses. And then I'll go on to talk in terms of more specific information around how we um, actually try to internationalize both our informal curriculum, our formal curriculum, and more recently what we call our, our hidden curriculum or the way we, we do things in our institution. I'll then talk a little bit about what we see as both the, the challenges and the benefits um, of international education, um, of both of which there are many, um, and um, just end um, on that. So just first of all, 
Just to, to um, I suppose, to note that in Ireland, actually, international education is not something new. So when you look back at the history of education in Ireland, we've been we've been known for a very long time as um, the island of saints and scholars. So when you look back at, at the Middle Ages um, in Europe, we we um, as a country actually had a reputation for for education coming from our ecclesiastical schools. So from our our um, um, monastic schools, um, where um, um, I suppose um, important people, particularly from Great Britain, but also from from further afield, from France, came to to study um, in Ireland under um, some of our more eminent um, scholars during the Middle Ages, and we. Um, a lot of the, the evidence of that comes from um, written texts from those times, but also from, um, I suppose, um, individuals who, who stayed in Ireland or who um, actually passed away in Ireland and, and their tombstones um, are still there. And when we look back at, at some of the writing and the texts from, from those times, we see actually that the beginnings of academic leadership and, and talk of, of abbots and the sorts of... Um, uh, academic structures, and um, we can see that the the beginnings of it from those very very early um, times. So just in, in Ireland, we um, and I think it's the same in in a lot of countries. But there's been an increasing focus on attracting international students um, to our higher education institutes. So um, the green bars are Irish students, and the the blue bar over the last. Um, um, years is our increasing number of international students um, taking part in, in courses across all our higher education institutes in Ireland and that's actually it's about an 80% infold, in, infold increase in the number of international students actually coming to Ireland um, to study. <coughs> In the Royal College of Surgeons um, in Ireland, so my institution, we have a particularly strong history um, in international um, education. And so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about who we are so you have an idea of the context in which we're operating. So we are an, an independent, not-for-profit, degree-awarding, higher um, education institute. And we've been around for a long time, so we were established um, in 1784. And our original purpose was to train surgeons, and that is still one of our main activities today. So we're still the national training body for, for surgeons um, in Ireland. And in 1886, we founded um, a school of medicine. And um, today, we are the largest school of medicine um, in Ireland. Um, and but we have we've broadened out our focus to healthcare sciences. Um, so we've pharmacy, we've physiotherapy, undergraduate courses, we've postgraduate courses um, in nursing, um, and we also offer a lot of um, research and postgraduate training. Um, and we have a significant research focus as well, particularly in um, the neurosciences, neurosurgery, neurology, and um, population health. So just to give you an idea of the context in which we are operating, um, we were ranked in, 2 in the top 2% of institutions um, worldwide. Um, and we have this really nice multicultural um, mix of, of students. So we have just over 3,000 students studying undergraduate medicine, pharmacy, and physiotherapy. But in our student mix, we have students from about 84 countries worldwide. So about 60% of our total student body um, is international. Um, we also have international campuses. So our headquarters are in Dublin, but we have a campus, um, a medical school in Bahrain. We have a medical school in, in the Middle East. We have a medical school in Perdana in Malaysia, a medical school in Penang in Malaysia. And we also have, we have an institute of healthcare in Dublin, and we also have a sister institute of healthcare in Dubai. So we, we have a lot of international and global um, activity that really facilitates our efforts at fully internationalizing um, our teaching and our learning um, for our students, which I'll come to. So that's just our, our global presence in terms of our campuses and our, our locations worldwide. 
Um, so we, we offer degree programs in four time zones, um, including the same medical curriculum in three different time zones. So the, the medical curriculum that we offer students in Dublin, we run exactly the same curriculum in Bahrain and exactly the same curriculum in Perdana, and they, our students did exactly the same exams. Um, and so there, there are logistical challenges um, to that, um, which, which I'll come to. We also have um, a significant global reach in terms of our postgraduate training. So we, we do a lot of postgraduate training in, in surgery um, in various um, parts of, of the world in addition to our, to our main campuses. So how did we come to have such an international um, student um, body? So we, we were established, as I said, back in 1784. And actually, very early on in, in the 1940s, um, American and Canadian students um, started to come to us. And our first Canadian student came in, in 1947. And then in, in the 50s, um, Malaysian students started to, to come to study medicine in Ireland. And also, as an institution, we made the decision to um, oppose apartheid um, and to offer um, places on a medical program to non-white South African students. In the 60s, um, Norwegian students started to come to us to study medicine. Um, and then from the 70s onwards, we've had particular interest in, from the Middle East and from Malaysia um, in terms of students coming to us to, to study medicine. And actually, the Middle Eastern and Malaysian students would make up the, the most of our, our current um, international student body. In terms of us getting started with, with sort of international campuses, um, our um, first Malay our, our Malaysian student, Dr. Godfrey Ge, came to us in 1965 to study medicine. And he's now a very prominent plastic surgeon in Malaysia. And he was really the, the catalyst for the development of our first international campus um, in Penang um, in Malaysia. Um, and then also other, um, I suppose, notable events was um, our, our South African students coming during apartheid and our first Canadian um, student. Um, so it just gives you an idea, I suppose the profile of our international students has changed over the years. So in the 60s and 70s, this is mainly where our students would have come from, so all over the world. Um, um, so literally from, from various different places. Whereas today our students mainly come from, so in terms of our alumni, um, mainly come from North America, um, from the Middle East and from Malaysia. So it's sort of a, a changing profile of international students um, over time. And because our student body is so international at undergraduate level, it means that our alumni, um, our graduates, um, are not going to stay in Ireland um, to, to work. The vast majority of them are going to go um, to, to all different parts of the world. And that's actually a really nice enriching experience for us because it means that we have alumni all over the world who can act as a network of mentors for our current students. And we have um, different ways, I suppose, of maximizing and trying to engage our alumni in terms of our education of our current students and trying to keep our alumni engaged to actually actively act as mentors um, to our current students. Um, So just in terms of, um, this was our, our international presence and actually um, thinking about how we can actually um, um, make you know, um, the use of our alumni in different parts of the world. Was Nelson Mandela, who actually said education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. And the fact that we're very proud of the fact that we have alumni um, in different parts of the world providing um, what we see as, as a good quality um, healthcare service. And actually Nelson Mandela came to us um, in 1996 to accept um, an honorary fellowship. Um, and he was very um, um, appreciative of um, our institution's um, stance on taking students um, during the, the apartheid years. Um, so he said, during the dark days of apartheid, your college provided places for many South Africans who were excluded by racist laws from medical schools of their own country. Through these doctors, you were making an inestimable contribution to our healthcare needs um, of our people. And we sort of appreciated that, that recognition from, from Nelson Mandela. 
So that was just to give you a flavor of, of the context and our, um, the history and development of our, both our international presence and our international student body. Um, in terms of the perspective of um, our students um, in relation to the multicultural environment we have in RCSI, um, sometimes we hear that students find it challenging, can find it difficult. Um, but actually, when we ask our alumni, when they've gone through the program, and we ask our alumni about their experience of studying in RCSI, they always talk about the benefits that they came with hindsight to see um, as, the, as coming the skills they learned as a result of that multicultural mix, and how it actually gave them a really good start in, in going to different places and working with, with different people from different backgrounds and different perspectives. Um, so a South African graduate, um, one of the quotes from him from the 80s, the beautiful city, the friendly Irish, the wonderful mix of people in different universities, the boycott of apartheid um, South Africa started by the amazing Irish, the freedom to be a person of colour without racial prejudice we, we were experiencing at home and the wonderful Irish who welcomed us South Africans. So it can be really heartening to hear from our, our alumni um, that um, our, our um, focus towards international students um, is, is appreciated. When we ask our Irish students um, who initially find the international mix um, quite challenging, um, when we ask our graduates, um, we're often quite surprised at how beneficial um, they find the, the international mix that they had during their, their study. So for instance, one of the quotes from um, a student, I realize now without knowing it at the time, or CSI gave me an international perspective, a cultural appreciation of the world at large. And it's, it's this sort of learning and this sort of implicit skills related to intercultural awareness, intercultural competence, having an intercultural and international outlook that we're increasingly trying to make explicit both for our students and our staff, because we're increasingly aware that it's only through making it very, very explicit that people, um, that our students and our staff fully reflect on it and fully benefit from our intercultural and international um, focus. So we've had a number of specific ways of doing that, um, both um, in our informal curriculum, which I'll talk about now. So through extracurricular and co-curricular activities. I'll come on to talk about our efforts within the curriculum and also our efforts um, um, in, in additional kind of hidden curricular activities. So this is our, our RCSI International Citizenship Award. It's the initiative I, I spoke about um, in Dublin that, that um, Professor Sampson mentioned. And it's, it's a relatively recent initiative where we have decided to make it very explicit that we value the um, skills of cultural competence that our students are learning and that we want to make it clear to our students that being culturally competent, being interculturally aware, and also having additional um, interpersonal um, skills and attributes will actually make our students better doctors, better physiotherapists, better <coughs> pharmacists. Um, so we, we have a formal definition of what it is to be an RCSI international citizen, and that's a graduate who demonstrates the skills and knowledge necessary to work more effectively in the diverse world of health and healthcare, and displays an understanding of the complexity of the public, patient, and professional perspectives involved in an increasingly globalized environment. I suppose that's kind of a complex way of saying that we really want um, our students to have the skills and um, the interpersonal skills to work effectively in multicultural teams, um, which they will, um, our doctors will go into um, very diverse um, multicultural and diverse healthcare environments and they will be working with patients who are coming from um, very different backgrounds, very different perspectives on health and on illness and we want our, our, our doctors and our other healthcare providers and leaders to be confident that they have the skills to both communicate effectively and to treat patients um, effectively. 
So the question was how would we actually um, go about doing this and um, making sure that it was actually kind of skill based as opposed to um, um, our students just having knowledge around culture but not actually demonstrating skills and competencies. So when we looked at our, our student body and what they were doing, we realised that our, a vast majority of our students were actually very civically engaged. A lot of our students were in a, um, getting involved in extracurricular activities through student societies, through volunteering, through education in initiatives, um, through peer-led teaching, um, which they were contributing um, both to, to life within our institution and also to the local community. And they weren't really getting any recognition um, for, for those sorts of activities. Plus, they were also learning skills around leadership, around teamwork, around problem solving, around communication through those activities that we weren't acknowledging, weren't making explicit, and also that our students weren't fully, um, I suppose, aware themselves that they were implicitly learning these skills. So what we wanted to do was to, I suppose, formally recognize the efforts that our students go to develop themselves outside of the classroom. We want to explicitly identify the skills that they were learning and to further support the development of those skills. Um, and then also make our students aware of the importance um, of the fact that they were carrying out those activities in this really unique multicultural environment that we have in our institution. And so they were implicitly learning the skills of cultural competence or intercultural um, awareness and communication. But we wanted to make that very explicit and further support it. So really the core of our International Citizenship Award is combining extracurricular activity with reflective um, learning and reflective practice, where we get our students to specifically identify the skills that they are learning in their extracurricular activities and to reflect on them and to reflect over time on the evolution and on development um, of those skills. This is a, our International Citizen um, Award um, students from, from last year. Um, and really the um, the cornerstone of, of the award is the fact that our students engage over a two-year period with an online portfolio, um, where our students have to actively reflect um, and think about the skills they're develop developing. We have to see longitudinal development of those skills and evidence of those skills. And we have a team of, of staff mentors who mentor the students and provide them with feedback and guidance um, around the development um, of, of their skills. So that's just one of the, the initiatives that we're doing in terms of the informal curriculum um, to try and get students thinking about um, the importance of having an international outlook, the importance of um, developing the additional skills that they will need if they have a career um, internationally. So one of the quotes from a recent um, International Citizenship Award student. So the award helped me value my classmates, professors and, and patients um, in unimaginable ways being given the tools to thoughtfully reflect on how our biases, cultures and family upbringings affect our interactions means I'm now equipped to manage any situation with grace and poise. I'm grateful to RCSI for allowing me to grow, make mistakes and learn in an accepting, culturally diverse environment. Uh, another initiative um, in terms of our um, so was informal curriculum is that we have devised um, in-house, so our HR, Human Resources Department, have developed an online cultural competence training tool for staff and for students. Um, and so we... Um, it's only it's a 40 minute online um, training tool. It's available through Moodle. Um, we make it mandatory um, for new staff and students and highly recommend it for, for current staff. Um, and it, it ensures that at least our new staff and students have some sort of common baseline around cultural awareness. And it flags the fact from the very start in our institution that this is something that is important um, and that we value um, enough to actually um, make it mandatory that, that, that you have to do this.
We've also started um, a lecture series on appreciating culture and this is where we invite national and international speakers um, but twice a, a semester to come and speak um, to students and to staff around themes and um, research and um, other topics of, of interest um, and then often um, when a visiting lecturer is, is giving one of these lectures they'll often have time to do a workshop um, with some of our, our students so to get a little bit more in depth in, in some of the, the issues that the, the lecturer has um, um, expertise in. So it's just some examples of some in recent initiatives that we're doing in the informal curriculum around trying to, to get both our students and our staff thinking about um, the importance of um, intercultural competence, um, but also additional um, personal skills and um, attributes um, that our students will, will need in the real world. When it comes to the curriculum, um, our curriculum development is an ongoing process. We're currently in the School of Medicine um, undergo undergoing a very significant um, curriculum revision and development. Our current curriculum um, has over the years um, evolved to um, to include, I suppose, topics with a more international um, focus. So for instance, in medicine, we include tropical medicine, there's international population health. Because we run the same medical program on three um, international sites, it means that we do have input to our curriculum from international colleagues. So even though the same basic lecture is given in Dublin, it's given in Bahrain, it's given in Pradana, the examples um, that we use to highlight um, some of the um, um, that we used to highlight some of the points that we're making, they they change based on the local context, and we're also very, I suppose, aware of always highlighting international differences um, in the topics um, that we are talking about. So we try to not have a very narrow um, focus on the curriculum. We try to think about it um, in terms of of more internationally and and what's relevant and um, for a very international student body. We have a, an international education forum for all our staff every year in June where we bring our international staff and our Irish staff together and we discuss our curriculum and we discuss how we can best provide the same curriculum that meets the needs for all of our, our international um, students. In terms of our new curriculum and the kinds of focus that we're um, that we are trying to put on it in terms of actually fully internationalizing our curriculum. We're very much guided by experts in the area such as Betty Liesk and her, um, her excellent work around how do you actually fully properly internationalize the curriculum. And when you look at, at what Professor Liesk calls um, internationalizing the curriculum, she talks about the incorporation of international, intercultural and or global dimensions into the content of the curriculum, as well as the learning outcomes, assessment tasks, teaching methods and support services um, on support services of a program of study. And so um, in, our, in our new revised curriculum, our new, newly revised medical graduate profile, for instance, um, actually has a pillar, sort of an overarching theme um, called global practitioner that's added to all the other um, themes that we expect or, or areas of competency that we expect our graduates to have. And under that, we have outlined um, at a graduate level profile the kinds of intercultural, social, interpersonal, teamwork and communication skills that we expect a medical graduate to have and to have shown evidence of. And then we, we, we sort of drill down through the curriculum from the medical graduate program to our program level learning outcomes, to our lecture learning um, outcomes, to our more activity group based learning <coughs> outcomes, making sure that, that those um, skills and competencies are highlighted and tracked throughout the curriculum so we can point to where exactly within the curriculum um, that we emphasize the importance of intercultural skills, the importance of global dimensions in the themes um, that our students are studying. 
But Elisk also um, talks about the importance of, of knowing, doing, and being, and, and that's something that we very much focus on. So we're no longer just focused on knowledge. So knowledge now is, is so easy to acquire. Um, you know, all our students, they, they just have to Google something to, to know something. There's no longer um, any real need for, for just providing knowledge to our students. If our, if our students know how to find really good evidence-based knowledge, if they have those skills, then they, they can easily find knowledge. So it's, it's really about, I think, developing um, our students into the, with the skills and competencies and mindset um, that they will need to, to work in a, in a rapidly changing um, environment. Um, so with, the, the, uh, with technology changing so rapidly, it really is um, very hard to foresee um, the kinds of knowledge and the kinds of skills that our students will need. But if you give them the sorts of personal attributes um, and the, the skills, um, then they can, they can more readily adapt and be more flexible in, in an increasingly um, changing world. Um, just to, I suppose, to mention the hidden curriculum, so um, experts in, in internationalization, including Professor Liesk and others, um, while they talk about the formal curriculum, the informal curriculum, they also talk about the hidden curriculum and the importance of the hidden curriculum. So uh, we all have our own organizational culture, our own way of doing things. So this is the way that things are done here. And um, I think it's important to address that directly. Um, and so we have made um, very, I suppose, concrete steps towards thinking about what is it that our hidden curriculum actually says to our students. Are all students treated equally? Do all students, regardless of where they come from, or regardless of any sort of maybe personal attributes or, um, any, or any aspect of difference, do they feel equally treated and do they feel equally welcome? And are we providing the same standard and level of resources to all our students, regardless of, of any sort of difference. And so we have, um, we've actually founded um, an equality, diversity and inclusion unit. Um, that unit has um, three full-time members of staff and they have actively reviewed all our human resources policies and we have, on foot of that, made significant um, changes um, both to policy but also practice and um, to ensure that equality, diversity, inclusion um, and respect for everybody is very much embedded into everything we do and um, because if we're saying that our students have to have evidence of, of um, these values and, and then we, we have to be seen to be doing it as an institution um, because um, you know, we, we model our values and we want to be modeling them both explicitly within the curriculum but also um, outside in the um, sort of informal or and hidden curriculum. Um, just to talk about a little bit about the complexities of um, our international education institution and um, how tricky it can be and in, in terms of how what we do to facilitate um, operating across different um, time zones and different continents. Um, so we we're currently working on um, bringing out the same Moodle system across different campuses. We still don't have that fully figured out yet, but we do. We are able to access each other's Moodle systems. We have a huge number of video conferencing meetings all the time, and we also have to schedule um, meetings at um, perhaps 8 a.m. In, in Dublin to facilitate um, times in Pradana. So it, it can get logistically very um, difficult, but it's, it's um, I suppose, in terms of international education, it's really important in terms of us staying very much in contact with our colleagues um, in different um, parts of the world, the fact that we actually have this sort of um, contact um, with, our, with our international colleagues. They mentioned that we have a meeting every June with all our international um, colleagues and that's really important for us to all come together and to have our own um, discussions and um, for everyone to share their perspectives on, um, on what it is we're doing, particularly within the curriculum and how our curriculum is suited um, um, to our, our wide range um, of students. 
We also try to facilitate staff and student exchanges across our campuses as much as we can. Um, I think particularly for our staff to go and teach for a period of time in the other campuses can be really helpful and really informative. Um, and we also try to facilitate some student exchange um, across programs where we can. Um, Operating on, on this sort of scale internationally um, means that we have to ensure that um, the same quality and the same standard um, of um, degree and of qualifications um, and, and um, that, that everything that we offer is offered um, to the same standard and extent across all our, our campuses. So we have a number of quality assurance um, checks, both internally and externally. So externally, we have a number of different agencies that need to accredit our program, um, both in Ireland and overseas. Um, internally, we have a number of different um, committees that are constantly reviewing and making sure that all our, our programs and curricula are um, meeting our own internal standards. And that because we are a professional training body, because we are um, awarding um, graduating doctors and other healthcare professionals, we have to meet the standards of the medical councils in Ireland and also in the overseas um, countries um, in which we operate. I mentioned a better, a really nice. Um, um, network of alumni and that really does give us this nice alumni mentor network and we have been quite successful at actually actively engaging um, our alumni to, to actually work as mentors so to formally join a mentor network and to um, have um, contact through you know, a lot of it is is um, engaging um, online with our students um, and, and it also facilitates our students to undertake electives um, in different parts of the world where we have alumni who can facilitate some of that. So it, it, we've been um, very proactively engaging our alumni in helping us to, to mentor our next um, generation of healthcare professionals. Just going to talk about um, what we see as the benefits to, to our community and to the economy in terms of our international focus. Um, we do have a lot of cross-cultural engagement as a result of our international students. Um, so a lot of our international students are sponsored by their home governments to come and study with us. And so we end up having a lot of embassy contact or their families often come with them. And that's a, it's a really nice cross-cultural engagement for us um, as um, Irish staff and an Irish institution to have that level of cross-cultural engagement. We also actively support our students to engage with the local community. So our um, institution is based in city centre in Dublin in what is traditionally quite a, a deprived um, local area in terms of socioeconomic um, deprivation. And so we actively support our students to give extra tuition and grinds to, to students um, in the local um, area. And we also have a number of other activities um, to try and engage with and support um, the, the local community, which I think is, is nice for the local community, but it's also really great for our students to be able to engage um, with our, our local community in that way. In terms of our economy, um, we, we estimate that we, that we contribute very significantly um, to, our, to our economy um, um, from our educational activities. We employ a significant number of staff, um, both um, in Dublin and, and um, obviously for additional staff overseas. We, because we are a healthcare institution, we have to partner with um, a number of different hospitals, and so we are the academic partner for a number of different hospitals, both within Dublin and um, other places um, in Ireland. Um, and we also estimate that our international students um, contribute quite significantly to our local economy um, in Dublin um, when they, um, during their, their years with us. Um, and then we also facilitate partnerships with other um, academic institutions um, in Ireland um, through um, different programmes. So um, I teach really, that's a, um, a technical college, a third level technical college in the south of Ireland. And some of our students who um, 
We get interest from students who may not have all the basic science requirements um, to, to study medicine. And so one option for them is to go down to, to um, this technical college in the south of Ireland for a year, where we run a medical commencement program. And they can study um, chemistry, biology, um, any of the basic sciences that they, they they didn't have, um, and then if they um, if they study those and are successful, then they can apply to, to the medical program in in Dublin. It also gives students who are wishing to come to to study medicine for a significant period of time in Dublin. It gives them a year um, where they're not actually in the medical program to sort of um, study and acclimatise to, to to being um, in Ireland, and that's quite a. Um, a sort of a nice program where we have a, a number of staff who, who take really good care of our students down in, in the south of Ireland. Um, international education can also be fun. Um, so we, we run a number of different, or, or students really run a number of different initiatives through student societies that celebrates our multicultural mix. So we run Cultural Diversity Month, we run um, different events. So this is a photograph taken from International Night, and it's where our students, through their clubs and societies, actually put on a, a show in one of our um, theatres in Dublin, where they, through dance and through music, um, celebrate their, their their um, heritage and um, their different um, backgrounds um, through through um, different forms of, of dance and, and music, um, which is, is really nice. So we have a number of different ways um, through which we actually get the students to come together and actually celebrate and, and have a little bit of fun around, around their, their different um, cultural backgrounds. Um, so just in terms of, I suppose, in our context in, in Ireland um, and our um, Ireland as, a, as an international education destination, um, I know it, it, it differs, but we, I suppose, see ourselves as having a number of, of um, assets in terms of being a destination for international students. We do have a reputation for, for education. We have a reputation um, for being friendly and, and welcoming. Um, but there are also very significant challenges to, to working in this space. Um, we are a single faculty institution and so it can be difficult, um, you know, it, it, it we need to make very significant efforts to promote ourselves internationally because um, being a single faculty, um, we're very sort of niche, I suppose. International education is expensive from both the institutional point of view and from the student point of view. Um, so very significant resources needed. In terms of our international campuses, um, often our um, staff like to travel and like to go abroad and have those experiences, but it, it can present challenges as well, and we're very aware um, that asking staff to go to international campuses um, um, can um, is, is a big ask. Um, and also, I think the working in, in a space of looking for international students, um, what we see, particularly in Ireland and the UK and in, in other um, countries, is that higher education institutes are, are becoming increasingly interested in attracting international students and and to date we um, have always attracted very very high our standards for for admission are, are quite high and so we've always had these very very excellent um, international students but I think it's going to become an increasingly competitive space and um, for um, institutions and um, to get and um, the best um, international um, students so really um, um, in terms of, of international activities and international higher education, um, it requires a lot of, of thought and um, um, I suppose resources um, in order to be able to, to, to do it fully and to do it um, properly. So I'm going to leave you there and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. already to uh, start. Otherwise, I, I wanted to just as a starting question, ask how was the attitude of the staff? How did it all start to get so proactive in putting into place all those um, more explicit uh, initiatives around internationalization? Yeah. 
was, were there some barriers uh, within the institution? How did you overcome them? Or was it just evident to anyone you know, that this was the step to, to go forward? So I think we, we had leadership on this from, from, from senior management, so from, from the very top. So our, our dean of the Faculty of, of Medicine and Health Sciences um, very much would support um, our initiatives and seem to be leading them. And so I think when you have um, a very strong vision um, being articulated very strongly from from um, from senior leaders, um, then that tends to bring people um, with them, um, and so um, both our our CEO and our, and our dean are very good at um, sort of creating a collaborative vision and bringing people with them and explaining to our staff the importance. Um, and the benefits. Um, so, so these initiatives have benefits both for our institution, for our students, um, but also for, for our staff as well. Um, so I think it's, it's about clearly articulating a vision to staff so that they understand um, that they're, they're part of something that, that will eventually make a difference, hopefully. Thank you. Are there some questions? I still have someone, so I can continue. <laughs> oh, there. And low. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts on your experience um, in in Dublin. I had actually two questions. I'll let you pick the one you want because I don't want to monopolize everything. Yes. You've you've mentioned an inclusion unit yes. with four four full time person working there. Three. Yes, yeah. and I was wondering actually what was their background because their task must be uh, to make sure that there is this international and cross-cultural approach that's kind of, of, of challenging and I was wondering th how was this inclusion unit working within your institution? That was one question. And, and then the other and, um, was about, which I think is a great initiative, the Citizenship Award mm -hmm. for the students based on extracurricular activities, but I was wondering how do you measure the, the skills? Okay. I'll let you decide no, which that's one fine. I, you I want. I can answer both of those. So actually our quality, diversity and inclusion unit is less to do with culture, cultural differences, and more to do with um, equality around gender and um, around um, services and resources for our students um, so um, so our CEO has this phrase we wants um, people to bring their whole selves to work so it's it includes like sexual orientation and um, sort of any aspects of, of diversity so that we make sure that all our facilities um, are actually inclusive of everybody so it's, that's so that unit is a slightly different focus on the cultural I mean it's part of it, but they don't necessarily focus as much on the, so it's really more um, other sources of, of diversity. Um, the assessment of the skills in relation to the International Citizenship Award, um, that is based around um, an e-portfolio. Um, so we have our students, our, we have a certain number of hours of extracurricular activities that our students have to do um, to be eligible for the award within a two year period. Um, and it's broken down into, we have different streams of activity and our students have to do 15 hours in three different streams. So education, so like peer led teaching or some sort of tutoring and maybe getting involved in student publications. Um, getting involved in RCSI Life, so clubs and societies, um, they might do some overseas challenges, some extracurricular research, so there's a number of different streams. And they have to catalogue their activities in an online portfolio, and they have to match their activities with the specific skills that they think they are developing as a result of those activities. And they have to carry out reflections prospectively as they go, reflecting on the development of their skills, um, and our, we have mentors paired, teamed with small groups um, who sort of give them feedback on their reflections and they're supposed to critically reflect, so not just describing lots of stuff they've done, they really have to think about um, what exactly it is they're, they're learning and how that will make them better doctors, better pharmacists, better physiotherapists. They also have to think about the cultural piece and how um, the multicultural environment 
present challenges for them and give specific instances and how they overcame, if they overcame them, or if they were to do it again, what they would do differently. Um, so they, they, they write those mini reflections throughout the two-year period and then at the end they bring it together in a kind of bigger reflective piece where they have to align it with sort of healthcare and the importance of these skills in healthcare. Um, and then we have a, a, an International Citizenship Award program board that reviews the portfolios and um, the interactions with the mentor. The mentor gives us some feedback and um, either approves the students for the award or not in some cases. Is that? Yeah. Thank you. So there's a lot more detail on that that I, I didn't go into, but yeah. Thank you for your um, conference. Uh, very, very interest, uh, interesting and very challenging. And uh, sorry for my English, very, very friendly. Frenchly. I have uh, two, two comments. Uh, uh, like uh, Nelson Mandela for education, I think uh, curriculum is a very powerful weapon f to, to, to internationalization and uh, to, to develop uh, um, intercultural learning outcomes. But I, I have two questions about that. Uh, first is the question of uh, means. Um, I, I think uh, the, 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 the it's not only a question of uh, learning outcomes, but also a question of methods, uh, teaching methods, evaluation methods. Uh, uh, international students who are coming here uh, say that uh, it's not uh, easy to to, to adapt um, the, the, the practice, uh, the, the, the practice uh, um, in, in function of uh, methods and uh, um, practice of evaluation, very different uh, in uh, English uh, countries, in the French uh, countries, etc. Um, and my question is uh, to, to say if you have an, an idea about um, methods who um, sustain, develop, um, promote uh, intercultural le learning outcomes. Uh, and the second question uh, is um, the question of uh, objective and the uh, finality. Uh, we, 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 we develop a learning outcomes um, eventually to, to attract uh, new students uh, uh, or to um, develop um, um, competencies for um, students, home students. And um, it seems it's not um, the same uh, in, in, in terms of content, of uh, practice, uh, in language to use. Um, uh, it's important for me to, to, to define first what is the objective of, of internationalization. Um, it's for uh, stu home students or for new students. It's not the same. Okay, so um, so your first one just about the um, assessment. Are, are there assessments that we can do that promote um, intercultural learning? Um, so we do a lot of teamwork, not a lot, but some <laughs> teamwork um, in different areas. Um, for instance, so the school of, we have a school of pharmacy. They do a lot of teamwork. Um, in the school of medicine, we do less teamwork, but still probably more than, than in other um, institutions. Um, and we always make sure that our teams are culturally mixed and balanced. Um, so we, we, we sort of proactively do that. And we also um, make sure that um, you know, teams for various activities that, that are part of the, the standard curriculum are balanced culturally. So our anatomy practicals um, are so where our students are, are, are um, doing teamwork around anatomy and, and um, we make sure there, so so that there is so at least our students are are at least interacting on a daily basis with with others from from different backgrounds. As part of the as part of team working in um, so for instance, I mentioned tropical medicine. That's one particular um, area of study where they they have teamwork um, and they get the students to actively reflect on working in the team um, and they have to you know they, they do all sorts of things around peer marking where the students or proportion of the marks is is down to peers actually marking you um, so I think team working is one area which you can promote into cultural um, 
differences. We, we do some flipped classrooms. I don't know if that's something you, you do here. And again, some of those smaller groups. So basically the smaller group teaching is where we make sure that there is um, an intercultural mix in the students who are interacting with each other. Um, what we have found as we have um, gotten larger and as our classes have gotten larger, that we have a larger number of students from, from the same countries and the same areas that they, they tend to actually mix less. Um, to, to mix uh, uh, groups, uh, work... Uh, yeah, so, uh, we, so because we know that, that students obviously uh, tend to stick t together when they, um, that we, we, we actually, we proactively break them up in, in teams and practicals and, and smaller group teaching and so that they're separated from, um, from people that they, they might sort of be inclined to spend um, more time in the classroom with. Um, so that's sort of, um, and then there are certain places we, we get them to, to reflect on that and, and think about that, what they're learning. Your second, sorry, your second. Um, the, the objective, the finality. Uh, oh, what's the point of it all in terms of? In, uh, internationalization, the, the cost of program to, to attract new students. If it's the objective, uh, I, um, I use uh, English only. Uh, I propose uh, content uh, very, um, uh, very um, popular. And, uh, and if I uh, want to develop a learning outcomes for, for Belgian students, for local students, it's not the same. I develop uh, extracurricular activities, uh, cultural activities, uh, uh, variety of languages um, and cultural activities, not only the, the main uh, stream. So I suppose we'd see the internationalisation as benefiting all our students, even our, our Irish students. So we don't use different um, strategies or, or different um, ways of, of attracting different pockets of, of students. Um, I suppose we see um, what we try to get across to, to our Irish students is that actually our international outlook is beneficial for you as well. This is not just about the, the students who are not Irish. Um, because our, um, particularly in medicine, our, our Irish students will, for the most part, for the postgraduate training, a lot of them will want to travel and, and go to um, other places to do their, their postgraduate training. It's important for them as well um, to have these sort of additional skills. And so, um, I mean, it, it's not really about attracting, we're not so much about the idea of attracting new students as really trying to maximize our current environment for the benefit of, of all our students. Because we realized actually there were a lot of things that our students are implicitly learning and we just really want to make it explicit both for ourselves and for our students that these are, are um, good skills and that there are many benefits of an international and a multicultural um, setting. Because um, often Students and staff sometimes only see the challenges, and I think you really need to, to make explicit the benefits as well. Thank you. Are there other questions? If I'm, yeah. Yes, thank you again for your for your very interesting pre presentation. Now, uh, one question regarding the administrative staff of your uh, institution. Yes. Uh, did your institution invest specific efforts in developing the intercultural skills of the administrative staff who has to deal with uh, more and more international population and more and more inter international academic staff? Or was it yes. just a natural process because you have a very long international story? So we do actually offer specific um, intercultural training um, for our um, administrative staff who are very, um, who have a lot of regular student contacts. So for our international, for our administrative staff in admissions, in fees office, in student records, in sort of student management, we specifically offer. It's it's not mandatory, but we offer every year, um, every year for for existing staff, and um, we have an external agency that comes in and provides um, cultural training um, for those staff members. Um, so that, that is available um, to them, but we don't 
I suppose we don't monitor that, so it's not mandatory. Um, as part of our International Citizenship Award, we have mentors and we have actually widened out the recruitment of our mentors to non-academic staff. And it's a way of us um, upscaling. We never have enough mentors. All our academic staff are too busy. They have too much on their plate. You ask them to do another thing and it's another, because they're already, you know, heavy teaching loads, heavy <coughs> research loads. And so, um, we actually had a very enthusiastic response from our non-academic staff, so it's our technical staff, our support staff, our administrative staff, in, in um, becoming mentors on the program. Um, in order to do that, we've had to um, provide training for our mentors. So we provide um, every year two half days of training. And um, we provide training for the staff in reflective practice, in cultural competence, in being a mentor. So our human resources department um, does a session on, on what it is to be a mentor. Um, and so we have found that to be quite effective. Um, and in terms of who from our non-academic staff becomes mentor, we go through our heads of department and we ask our heads of department to nominate um, members of non-academic staff so that that's a, I suppose, um, our heads of department might know who might be suitable for that role. Um, and we also, I suppose, make it part of um, what we call professional development. So all of our staff have a professional development review with their head of department every year. And this will be something that our heads department bring up with staff as something that might be um, developmental for, for the staff member, if, if, if appropriate. And last question, is your administrative staff very international? At least in Dublin. Very. International? Uh, no. <laughs> so our, our student body, so that is something we're aware of. Our student body is very international. Our staff in Dublin, um, both our academic staff and our administrative staff and our technical staff are not very international. Um, so there is a bit of a discrepancy there. So we would like to have more international staff. Yeah, so it's yeah, on, on our radar. Other questions or comments? Yes, thank you very much for your lecture. Uh, I have a question. Uh, how your own society is uh, judging the internationalization of uh, your university? Or are accepting the different uh, people who are treated by uh, international people? And what is the effect of your work on the local uh, communities in Ireland? Um, sorry, so just what is the effect of... But, but I, you, you know, I, I have uh, the, the idea that uh, university is as also a uh, local history, and the fact that you are internationalizing your own uh, education program, maybe, I don't know if it has, can uh, affect the perception of the Irish citizen about the stranger. Oh, is so it having a, a bigger having impact? Maybe a better acceptance due your own action. I don't know. Um, this is more general. The citizens, uh, yeah. people in town in Dublin, I mean, I, I think impact. that would be probably a stretch to say that we're impacting on. on um, um, I'd, I'd like to think so, but I don't have any evidence that that is um, the case, that we're having um, an impact on. I mean, I suppose some of our outreach work in the local community, we would hope, is fostering sort of intercultural understanding. And so we have this very large group of international students um, in you know, the city centre in, in Dublin. And um, we would hope that some of those interactions with our, our local community is fostering some increased understanding and, and open-mindedness and tolerance, but um, we haven't looked at that in any way. I don't have any evidence um, either way on that, but it might be interesting actually to um, get feedback from some of our, our local community and our local residents. Um, and we, we haven't as yet embedded um, a research component into any of our initiatives, but it's certainly something we would like to do in terms of actually evaluating whether these initiatives are um, particularly something like our International Citizenship Award, whether that's actually achieving 
what we think it's achieving with our students. Um, so some sort of, it, it, you know, some sort of um, um, evaluation, formal evaluation of of um, what we think it's it's achieving. Um, but as part of that, it would be nice to look at at getting feedback from some of our, our local, but we, we, we haven't, so I'm, I'm not sure actually. But. I would like to ask another question about the role of language. So um, obviously the situation in Ireland is different to Belgium because you can use English, which is widely used and it's also in a way the international language. So, um, is there part uh, or space in your program also to open up to other languages? How do you use uh, possibly your students? So, what, how is the language policy embedded actually in all your initiatives? Um, so, to study in our institution, all our um, our students have to have a certain level of, of English proficiency, and so everything is run through English. So, we we don't actually. Um, that is one area actually that we don't really do do much in. We we don't actually run any everything is is through English. And we do encourage our students um to use English because often if they if large groups of, of students who, who share the same um, native language are together, we do find that they, they, they speak they don't speak English and it further sort of isolates them from the rest of the other students and again it's a factor in a lack of integration and um, so we actually we actually encourage use of English on campus and um, as much as possible it, and I think it's also particularly important because our students most of our students will eventually be going out to hospitals and um, in third year fourth year fifth year and will have significant patient interaction and um, most of our patients will be will be speaking English and so we need our students to, to keep up their English language skills. So we haven't actually done anything around other languages, but um, but it's it's yeah it's I know it's an interesting um, and it's it's one way of of thinking about further internationalizing. Um, it's a challenge for English speaking countries. Yes, I mean, it is. for us, of course, yeah. also a challenge, but in a different, in a different yeah. way. Yeah, it is. Yeah, so. Yeah. Okay, so, um, yeah, no, sorry. Yeah. It's just a quick question. Uh, do you have entry requirement for the program? And if so, uh, yeah. do you already include cross-cultural awareness in so these? For, for which part now, for, for the, do you mean for the award program or for their for, study? For the study in, the, in general. Oh yeah, so I mean it, it's, it's entry into medicine, so that the, the, and pharmacy or physiotherapy, so our entry criteria are, are really high um, in terms of, it depends where somebody's coming from. So for an Irish student, they have to get really high points in what we call the leaving cert. So it'd be the same as your baccalaureate or A-levels or... And beside the grades, do you already include cross-cultural awareness? Do you no, test no, no, we're not, no, not nearly that progressive at a, at a secondary level. Um, so no, it, it's academic requirements um, for entry. So we, we don't have any, um, so academic requirements and then English language proficiency, yeah. Okay, did I not miss anybody? Okay, then let's thank again our speaker for a wonderful interaction.